Let me read the passage that we're going to be going through this morning uh, as we begin our series called Eternal. As we look at uh, this passage here, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 11, where it says, uh, Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then. You still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. He was buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scriptures have said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I'd been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it's all because God poured out his special favor on me and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach. For we all preach the same message you have already believed. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, uh, and we do lift up our building project. Father, we pray that you would provide uh, that uh, money so that we could just get started right away, Father. Uh, but we trust you. We wait on you, Lord. We're here for you, not for us, God. May your will be done. Thank you for this passage, Lord. Thank you for the incredible truth of the resurrection. Uh, Lord, as we think about this deeply together, I pray that you would, uh, that you would speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Ron got divorced from Laura some 40 years ago. Uh, Laura's sister, Janie, uh, is a believer. She's a journalist. Um, and Ron stayed in touch with his, his in-laws. Um, he's a steady guy, decent guy, but he had no use for religion. He's never rude about it, but he had the attitude, hey, it's okay for you, but I'm fine without, without any ideas about God. Years ago, uh, this is a true story, years ago, Ron experienced a couple crazy seizures. Uh, and then it came to light just last fall that uh, Ron had a brain tumor. Uh, so he went, underwent radiation. It helped. Underwent chemo. Chemo knocked him out. Just set him for a loop. Uh, so the night after his first treatment, apparently he had another seizure he fell out of bed, and it seems that the, the, he turned over the bed on top of himself. He was, he was alone. His son had to break down the door of his apartment. Ron had been trapped without food and water for three days and nights in his apartment. Now, when his um, uh, Christian journalist sister-in-law heard about this, uh, she thinks, you know, Ron being trapped three days and three nights, that reminds me of Jesus being in the tomb for three days and three nights. I wonder if Ron's going to experience a resurrection before he dies. And so um, the family then uh, began praying for that. The, the in-laws began praying for that. Uh, Ron improved for a few weeks with rehab, but then uh, he took a hard downturn. It became quite clear that he wasn't going to last too much longer. And so the family organized shifts to just sit with him while he's dying. Uh, they say he was a demanding patient, always needing bed adjustments, always wanting vending machine snacks. Uh, one of his in-laws, uh, sister-in-laws, Melissa, who knew the Lord, would stay with him. Uh, the conversation was pretty light, family stories, long camping trips that he loved. But one day, as Melissa's leaving, Ron stared at her and said, Melissa, give me the truth. Give me the truth. I want to talk to you today about the truth. The resurrection truth. You see, this chapter, and I know we only read the first 11 verses, it's a long chapter, so we're going to be in it for a number of weeks. But this is the resurrection chapter. And it seems in verse 12 it said, some say there's no resurrection. I think that's what Paul's dealing with. And listen, it's important for you and I to know there is a resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, but also, as we'll see in this series in the coming weeks, your resurrection. You see, the resurrection is how you go from the temporal to the eternal. Uh, the, the transformation of an earthly body to a heavenly body. 
and the information that you need to be transformed from temporal to eternal is called the gospel. Everybody say gospel. 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 Good. That was amazing. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and so this, this gospel, this information, and it's much more than information, is what takes us then from temporal to eternal, from no resurrection to resurrection. No gospel, no resurrection. No resurrection, no eternal. So today what we're going to do as we look at this chapter, we're going to talk about what is the gospel. What does the gospel do? And then what do I do in light of the gospel? It deals with all of that. So let's, let's start with this. What is the gospel? And, and whenever you think of gospel, I want you to think about 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because this is the gospel, the resurrection chapter. And the number one item on our, our list of what is the gospel is this. Christ died. Uh, look at verse 3. It says, I passed on to you what was most important, what had been passed on to me. Christ died. You see, in verse 1, he says, he says, you welcomed the gospel or the good news, depending on your translation. I like the word gospel. He says, it's this gospel. And then verse 3, here it is. I'm going to define the gospel now for you. And Paul says, Christ died. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus takes away the sin of the world. He said of himself, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. So he lays down his life and he takes away the sin of the world. It was the sixth hour and there was darkness over the entire land until the ninth hour. The sun was darkened as our Savior hung on the cross. The veil of the temple. All, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I'm sorry. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I don't know about John. Uh, but it, when, when, the, when, when Jesus died on the cross... The first thing that happened is the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to the bottom. Meaning that God did it. Why was that? Because now the way into God's presence, the Holy of Holy, was opened. Because Jesus died, all the sin was placed on Jesus. Now you have access to the throne of God. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He breathed his last. The book of Romans says God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. You see, people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. So when you think of the gospel, and in short, the gospel is the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it's his life and his death, his burial, his resurrection. So number one, we see that Jesus died. Very important though, number two, he died according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures, you see that at the end of verse 3. You see that in the middle of verse 4. Jesus died according to the scriptures. Paul, of course, is referring to the Old Testament scriptures. He tells us that the death of Christ was in accordance with the Old Testament. Last Wednesday, as we're going through the book of Genesis, we read this verse, Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity or hatred between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his head. Heal. This is talking about the Messiah. It's a veiled reference. It's called the Proto-Evangelium, which is the first gospel there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. By the time you get into the Old Testament, you have, uh, or farther into the Old Testament, you have the Jewish sacrificial, sacrificial system. Uh, and all of this foreshadows the death of Jesus Christ. Perhaps the best Old Testament scripture, when, when Paul's writing according to the scriptures, Jesus died according to the scriptures, I think he's probably thinking Isaiah 53. Do you know Isaiah 53? Fascinating passage. I encourage you to read it. Let me read a couple of verses. It says, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity. It's another word for sin. The iniquity of us also. Your sin was laid upon Jesus. Do you understand? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Number three, we're talking about the gospel. He was buried. Look at verse 4, 1 Corinthians 15. It says, he was buried. What does burial do? It confirms the death. <laughs> you don't bury someone who is alive. Uh, in New Testament times, the corpse would be washed, the arms and legs would be bound with linen, the head would be bound, a normal burial, burial would include mourning. 
The family would hire musicians. People would come. Professional mourners would come. Uh, but there were no mourners there for, that were hired for Jesus' death. He died as a criminal. But Nicodemus and Joseph took his body off the cross, wrapped it, placed it in a tomb. Uh, tombs were cut out of rock. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea had his own tomb. He gave it to Jesus. They placed him in there. He was buried. This is part of the gospel. It's part of the story. Now, up until now, that's bad news. Uh, because the good news happens in verse 4 where it says, He was raised from the dead. Are you thankful Jesus was raised from the dead? And we celebrate this every Easter. No, we celebrate it every Sunday. No, we celebrate it every single day of our lives. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, a group of women were on their way to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. And when they arrived, the stone was rolled away. There was an angel that appeared to them and said, I love this, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Listen, uh, dead people don't come back to life. I've, I've seen dead people. Raise your hand if you've seen a dead person. Anybody seen a, a dead person? I don't want to be creepy this morning. But dead people don't come back to life. It just doesn't happen. The spirit leaves. But Jesus came back to life. And he never died again. I mean, his death and burial occurred in time and space. Real historical events. Therefore, his resurrection is a real historical event. A.W. Tozer said, The account of the life of Jesus Christ is the only biography known to man that does not end with death and burial. It's the only record of human life that joyfully hastens on to the next chapter after the last. Josh McDowell said this, After more than 700 hours of studying this subject, I've come to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most remarkable fact of history. If you don't believe it, do your own homework, do your research, but I can save you time. It's true. It's real. It happened. It's the foundational doctrine of Christianity. We'll see that as we get farther into 1 Corinthians 15. His resurrection validates his identity as deity. It proves that he is God. His resurrection demonstrates the ero irrevocable victory over death and the grave. Now, if you still had power after you died, if you could control things and do whatever you wanted to do, you could say, okay, no big deal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to life. I'm just going to get back into my body and come back to life. Nobody has that power, but Jesus did. Uh, this secures our salvation. It secures our future resurrection. I mean, he is alive today, <laughs> brothers and sisters. I mean, we are following the one who has power over death. Unbelievable. But it gets better. Look at verse 5. He appeared to many. This is part of the gospel story, his appearance. Uh, notice the language of the scripture. It says um, uh, not just that he was seen, but that he appeared. Uh, it depends on your translation that you're reading. But he appeared to how many people? If, if you look at verses 5 to 8, how many people, if you count them there, how many people? Over 500. I mean, over 500 people saw Jesus in his resurrected body. I mean, give that some thought at one time. Well, they all hallucinated at the same time. Sorry, not going to happen. Well, they were on drugs. And come on, 500 people. No. Uh, how many witnesses do you need to prove something is true? Two, three, right? Like if you say, oh, Pastor Pat, I, I saw you in fries yesterday. And if I deny it, no, nope, wasn't there. And then somebody else says, no, no, I saw you there about 3 o'clock yesterday. I'm saying, no, nope, I wasn't there. And then four or five other people say, no, I saw you in fries at 3 o'clock. You were in aisle number 14 buying whatever. At some point, I have to, okay, yeah, you're right, I was there. Why? Because there's witnesses. Jesus, I mean, this is just closed case, man. He's, I don't even know what to say. I mean, if you don't believe the resurrection, you've got a problem. There's absolutely no doubt that Jesus was resurrected. Okay, so this is the gospel. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He was seen by all of these people. So what does the gospel do then? What does it do? Well, if we go back to verse 2, it says, it is this gospel that saves you. So the gospel saves you. Listen, big point here. Becoming a Christian is not changing your mind about your values. It's not what it means. Becoming a Christian is not just following some good ideas. 
Becoming a Christian is not just working on your bad habits and developing good habits. Becoming a Christian is not going to church every Sunday. All of those things may be important, but becoming a Christian is responding to the gospel message. Believing the gospel message and experiencing a supernatural life transformation. This is Christianity. It's not the power of positive thinking. It is the power of God that takes you from hell to heaven, from death to life. You see, sin separates you from God. Ultimately sends you to hell. But the gospel forgives you for your sin. The gospel saves you and sends you to heaven. John 3, 17 For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Saved from what? Eternal death. Life apart from God for all eternity. Uh, Saves you from the penalty of sin. The end result of sin is death. You don't have to die forever. Uh, Romans 1.16 is a fantastic Uh, verse about the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Do Do you hear that? Everyone who believes experiences the power of salvation, the power that comes from God. This is the gospel. Jew first, also the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so this news about Jesus, if you believe it, changes your life. But the gospel also gives grace. How do, I, how do I see that? Well, I see that in verse 10 where Paul says, whatever I am now, it is all because of God's grace. God's grace poured out upon me. I am what I am because of the grace of God. Paul, Paul says, I worked hard, but it was really the grace of God that was working in me and through me. Listen, you are what you are because of God's grace as revealed in the gospel. The gospel is a message of grace. When you get saved, you receive a reward. For what, you might say? For nothing. (laughs) You get a reward for nothing. You didn't do anything and you get a reward. That's grace. Are you kidding me? Normally when you get something reward-like, you're like, what did I do to deserve this? And when you ask that question as it relates to your salvation, it's like nothing. You did nothing to deserve this. But God loves you and he gives you grace. He gives you his riches. He gives you forgiveness. Forgives your sin. God knows and he accepts you. He gives you his spirit, new life. One of my favorite passages about grace is the book of Titus, uh, chapter 2. You might want to write it down. We don't have it ready to put on the screen. But Titus 2, uh, verses 11 to 14. It says, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Okay, so there there you have all men have the capacity to be saved, unlike some theological circles that don't believe that. All men have the capacity to be saved. The grace of God brings salvation to all men. And then it says, anybody do sentence diagramming? Anybody like sentence diagramming? A couple of you. I love sentence diagramming. So you have the grace of God what does it do? It does two things. Number one, it saves you. Okay. Number two, it does all this other stuff. And let me read it. It says, it teaches us. So the grace teaches us the following. Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Write it down. It's too much to exposit here. Titus 2, 11 to 14. This is all what grace does. It it teaches us all about the blessed hope, all about the life of Christ. Okay. Gospel's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, So what do I do now in light of the gospel? Having all this information, understanding the gospel, what do I do? Well, number one, believe it, duh. You know, you, just, you believe it. Believe it. You know, if you, uh, many of us take medicine for different ailments that we might have. Uh, sometimes it's temporary for a certain season. Sometimes it's permanent for the rest of our life. The medicine only works if you take it. 
The gospel only works if you believe it. Folks, believe it. Believe it. Oh, I don't understand. Just believe it. You will grow in your understanding. Number two, you receive it. It's not just an intellectual acknowledgement. There's a reception that must take place. John 1.12, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believed in his name. So, so believing the gospel, receiving the gospel, it's, it's a, a, a two-pronged faith. There's, there's, there's a belief and there's a trust. There's an active component to this. That's, that's the reception. I've often talked about this. If you've been coming here any length of time, you've probably heard me say to give Jesus your allegiance. To, to pledge your all-in, no-turning-back commitment full out to following Christ. That's what we're talking about. And that was the New Testament understanding of belief. Acts 2.38, Peter said, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter said, Repent. What shall we do? He said, Repent. Um, so we have believe, receive, we also must repent. Repent means that we change our mind, we agree with God about our sin, and we believe in him, we repent of our sin. There's no salvation without repentance. But I like uh, number three here, stand in it. Uh, Paul said at the very beginning of this passage, he says to stand in the gospel. Um, you welcomed it, you stand firm in it. You just don't believe and receive the gospel. It's not just for salvation. We stand in it to continue. Uh, stand means that we continue to remain loyal. Uh, becoming a Christian is not something that you do way in the past and then you forget about it. Becoming a Christian is something that you do and it transforms you and you continue to stand. Here, here's the way I can say this. Your identity is firmly planted in Jesus Christ. He loves you no matter what. The gospel truth will always be true, so you keep believing, you keep trusting, you keep growing. You stand in the gospel. To stand in the gospel means that you're part of a community of the Spirit, the church. To stand in the gospel means that you keep going back to the resurrected Jesus. He's still alive, which means he's still accessible. Hebrews chapter 4 Seeing that we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. When? Whenever you want. How often? Whenever you want. Just as much as you need grace. Get yourself there to the throne of God. Stand in the gospel. What he did for you is real. It's true. We stand in it. Lastly, what do we do because of the gospel? We preach it. We preach it. You see, the gospel means that you have a new mission. Uh, this is a mission to be shared. Now, this doesn't mean that Everybody becomes a pastor and starts a ministry. Now, God may call you to be a pastor. God may call you to start a ministry. This means that we talk about Jesus everywhere we go. We give people invitations. We give them New Testaments. We give them the Gospel of John. Listen, your life is a platform. It's a platform for the Gospel. Your life is your pulpit. Don't be afraid to talk about Christ. People in this world are hungry for hope. Okay. I'm going to confess something to you. I went to the Donald Trump rally on Friday in Glendale. No, stop, stop. No. The reason why I'm saying that, I, and I, I got invitation. My wife and I, we were able to, you know, have the, you know, you don't have to stand in line. They let you in and all of that. But, but um, and I, I only went because I was invited to go. But here's why I say that. We're talking about Jesus. And there was a time there, and listen, I'm, I'm voting for Donald Trump. I believe that the values of the Republican Party, I'm getting myself into trouble now, but the values of the Republican Party line up better in my estimation to the Bible than the platform of the Democratic Party. Okay? Now, 
as, as I heard when Rob McCoy was here and he said this, and I think it's so true, he said, there will never be a perfect president. If you're waiting to vote for a perfect leader, you're going to wait until the millennial reign of Christ. You're always going to vote for somebody who has problems and flaws. But the reason why I'm bringing this up now is because there was a moment when they introduced Donald Trump and he was standing on the stage and everybody's going nuts and screaming and, and, and you know, they're playing over the loudspeakers, I'm proud to be an American and all of that. And, and you know, it was a fine moment, but, but something troubled me because it felt like people were worshiping him. I will worship no man. My hope is not in a man, you know, and I'm not, I'm not accusing people of worshiping Donald Trump, but it just felt that way. And maybe I was wrong and maybe I didn't see it, but, but it just, it just was a little odd to me. Uh, and so, so as much as you love or hate your candidate, your hope must be in Jesus Christ Guaranteed, if President Trump is elected in January, there are going to be problems in the United States. He's not going to fix everything, okay, folks? Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And so you must, I hope you're talking more about Jesus than you are President Trump. Okay? So don't be afraid to talk about Jesus. It gives people hope. gives them truth. Some may reject. Um, Luke chapter 10, verse 16. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. He who rejects me rejects him who sent me. And I'll tell you what, I saw a bumper sticker as we were out in the parking lot going in, and the bumper sticker said, um, you're not a Christian if you vote Democrat. Folks, that is wrong. That is not true at all. To be a Christian means that you believe in this gospel message. That's, I mean, you can, you can be wrong about everything in life, but if you believe in the gospel message, you're a Christian. Do you remember Ron in the hospital dying? Melissa's leaving one day. He stares at her, give me the truth. She gave him the gospel. She shared with him the gospel, and he did not reject it. He did not accept it, but he did not reject it. When she told him, hey, Ron, I'll be back, he said, bring the book. And she knew what he meant. And so on the first day with the book, she, went, she read through the Sermon on the Mount. The next time she read six more chapters of Matthew, on through Mark, on into Luke. Was he listening? At one point she asked him, is that enough for one day? By then Ron could barely speak, but he managed to say two words. More Jesus. See, you can never get enough Jesus, can you? At Ron's memorial service, Melissa shared how the only time he stopped her with a question was to ask what Hosanna meant. And she said, I think it means save. And at that moment, Ron held up his hands and said, Hosanna. Was he crying out to the Lord to save him? I think he was. You know, Melissa never led him in the sinner's prayer or got any kind of a confession for him. But he wanted more Jesus. And he raised up his hands and he said, Hosanna. He said, save. I believe Ron's alive today because of the gospel.